Uh, yes, it was. I've been working at Kazi Publications for about 15 years. This is the oldest Muslim publisher in America. They were established in 1972 in Chicago. And um, I, so as a writer, I've written about 20 books and I've translated maybe, maybe 25 more about Islam and Irfan and Tasavvuf and Sufism and so forth. So in all cases, I, they, I came across Quranic verses and I would always look to see how other people had translated these verses. And in many cases, I was very disappointed because they used the Arabic words in the English translation. So I thought, well, if somebody doesn't know the Arabic or they're not Muslim, they're not going to be able to understand this translation. And then also there's a particular word, uh, kafir, which is usually translated as infidel or disbeliever or unbeliever. Well, I realized, uh, based on my knowledge of classical Arabic grammar, that I studied at Tehran University and then with a private teacher, that the word originally, the most important meaning of it is to be ungrateful. So when you translate the word kafir in uh, the Arabic, in the English translation of the Quran, as someone who is ungrateful, where the context allows, the most important, of course, is the context, and in many cases it does allow it, it then it becomes an inclusive translation of the Quran rather than exclusive. So it becomes a translation of the Quran that is uh, that's for everybody because I do believe that the Quran was revealed for all of humanity and not just specifically for Muslims. So the translation then has to be such that people from other faiths and other cultures and other traditions uh, can understand it. So I felt that there was no inclusive translation of the Quran, that was one. Also, I feel that the Quran is universal, it's for all time. So when you do need translations of the Quran that have footnotes, that have commentary and so forth, but you also need a translation that doesn't have any excess baggage. It's just straight the translation. Because I wanted to people to read the Quran and to be able to say, this is how I can identify with this. This is this is meaningful to me today. This is something that speaks to me today. Rather than going back to the history and when was this revealed and what battle was it or what situation was it, uh, if it is eternal, which I believe that it is, and of course that's the Arabic of the Quran that's eternal, not a translation, it's just that. It's just a in translation, interpretation. It's not the holy word. And the Vatican or the blessings that you get from listening to the Arabic or reciting the Arabic is far different than the blessings that you get from reading the translation. But you cannot identify with something that you don't understand. And the Quran itself says to speak to people in their own language. Well, their language happens to be over here, happens to be English. So you need to use all English language, all English ideas. For instance, when the Quran talks about prophets, many of the translations use Musa and Esau, and then you meet Christians and they don't know who they are, but when you say Moses and Jesus, they say, oh well, we know who they are, they're in our holy book too. And then you've made a connection with someone and you've brought them into your way of thinking and you're going into theirs. So it's a kind of uh, human understanding that develops. So these were some of the reasons uh, for why I felt a translation of the Quran was necessary. Another was, for instance, the word Quran means recitation. Therefore, the most important part of the Arabic of the Quran is to, be, to hear it recited. And when in English translation they put it in paragraphs as if uh, looking, it look, then looks similar to the Old Testament or the New Testament, in the first place, you've had to change the translation to do that because the Arabic continues on. It doesn't stop with the period at the end of a verse number. It continues on. So you've had to distort the translation. So in the translation that I did, there's no paragraphing, and it, it is you could listen to the Arabic recitation and read the English as you're going along and get the blessings from the Arabic but understand the meaning as you're reading the English. So these are some of the, the different characteristics and qualities that I was looking for in a translation. And then, of course, the other uh, major area was in chapter 4, verse 34, where uh, the English translations have all said, Husbands who fear disobedience on the part of their wives first admonish them, then abandon their sleeping places, then beat them. 
So when I looked up the word Daraba or Idrab, um, and I understood it from the teachings that I had, it has 26 different meanings. So why are we choosing a meaning that's harmful to another human being? It just doesn't make sense, and it is not part of the Quranic message and the moral and legal principles of the Quran. Then I realized that, of course, as we Muslims all know, the Prophet never beat any of his wives, and we're all very proud of the fact that the Prophet never beat his wives. But what we don't recognize is that this is a command in the Quran. So we have to say, the, pro the blessed Prophet, peace and the mercy of God be upon him, did not carry out a command of God. Now, what is more important, that the Prophet carry out a command of God or that he not beat women? Well, we've created a contradiction here, and we've diminished the Prophet in the eyes of other people. Whereas, what did the Prophet do when he had domestic unrest? He went away. And that's another word, that's another meaning of idrab. Uh, in the first form of the verb, which it appears that in this in this verse. So why can't we follow the sunnah of the prophet and do as he did and understand it to mean to go away? And I was very happy to have uh, found out quite recently that Ayatollah Makorem Shirazi has changed his translation on the internet. Of course, those books that were published a long time ago uh, have to remain, you know, whatever they were. But he has trained, uh, changed the translation on the internet, and at the end he says, on hara tark konid, which means go away from them. So I, I was very uh, happy to see that the clerics and the ayatollahs are beginning to become awake and aware to this situation. Now, what happened when, in uh, the further research that I did, I found that in uh, chapter 2, verse 231 of the Quran, it says, husbands who fear disobedience, it says, husbands who want to divorce their wives must do it honorably. They cannot harm their wife. And the word there is zarar. They cannot harm their wife. So I sat back and I thought about this and I said, well, let me see. I know that Islam encourages marriage and Islam discourages divorce. But let me see what we've created here. What we've created looking at it from a woman's point of view, is that a woman who agrees to a divorce cannot be harmed. But a woman who wants to stay married, a Muslim woman who wants to stay married, does so under the threat of being beaten. Well, this does not make sense, because this is uh, making divorce sound a lot better in my eyes than, than staying married under the threat of being beaten. So we've created a contradiction by misinterpreting 434 that's not in the verse to begin with. And then in addition to that, in chapter verses 6 through 9, the Quran says that if a husband accuses his wife of anything and he is the only witness, she has a right to defend herself by swearing an oath five times that her husband is not sincere. But what happens in a real life situation? The husband and wife have an argument. The husband accuses his wife, for instance, of flirting with another man and then beats her, according to 434, because he has made himself both judge and jury. And the wife has not had a chance to take advantage of being able to defend herself. So this is, again, denying women rights that are given to them in the Quran by uh, misinterpreting what the word idrabahunna means. So in this translation, I feel very blessed to be the first English translation that translates it to say, husbands who fear resistance, that is, neshuz, resistance on the part of their wives, first admonish them, then abandon their sleeping places, then go away from them. Then when you talk to the jurists, they say, well, no, it can't be that because idrab or daraba is a transitive verb and can only take a direct object. So when you say go away, from them, you've made the object indirect and you've made the verb intransitive. So my response to them is, first of all, the blessed prophet who was unlettered, how come he understood it to mean go away? Did he sit back when the verse was revealed to him by God, from God and say, I wonder, is this a transitive verb or intransitive? No, he understood it as, mean, as the meaning of go away and that is what he did. So I disagree with the fact that they say that this is the transitive or intransitive. 
And the second argument that the jurists use is that they say this is only this verse 434 only relates to women who are nishus, that is, husbands who fear nishus on the part of their wives. And they translate that as being disobedient. So therefore, fine, that's what they want to say, it's wives who are nishus. But then what happens when we get to chapter 4, verse 128, and it says wives who fear nishus on the part of the husband. It's exactly the same word. Why are these two words translated differently? If it means disobedient in 434, then it has to mean disobedient in 4128.